video is coming through fine. Otherwise, good to see you all. Thanks all for being here. It's, it's a really, really pleasant evening here in Warsaw. It's been raining, it's been cold, but things are good. And I hope all of you have been having a good day wherever you are. Right. So we have Joel Thomas. We have God is my salvation. Villainous, welcome. Good to see you. Shay Califer. Uh, we've got Vegetal Asbestos. Uh, I don't know where you got that name, but yeah, certainly stands out. XYZ, welcome. Sister in Christ, Horse, and Ben Yosef. Good to see you all. PJ, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, let me just double check. Yes, I look to be streaming. Okay, audio is coming through. So, short update. I am, I've am. i been very busy working on Darwin. And Tiger, welcome. Chloe, welcome. Good to see you. Chloe, yeah, you're going to love this talk on Darwin when I get to it. Uh, it's definitely going to be educational. Um, we'll see how science turned evil. How Darwin legitimized science. Rather, how Darwin legitimized evil. How, yeah. Um... Yeah, let's see. Ben Yosef, Prolaf Chloe. It's Ernestos, right? Ernestos. That's the Greek name. We need to take Constantinople back. We do. We do. Um, yeah, so we do need to take Constantinople back. Um, all right. So just so you guys know, um, take a moment to read this fun sentence. I started with this because atheists apparently lose their minds when supposed creationists quote this about Darwin. So I thought, hey, it'll, it'll annoy them. So let me start with that. This gives us a sense of just what a wonderful person good old Darwin was. I acted cruelly, for I beat a puppy, I believe, simply from enjoying the sense of power. But the beating could not have been severe, for the puppy did not howl. <laughs> Martin Luther, yeah, his family threw away many cats a month or something like that. And the church said, hey, it's okay. The, remember, the church said it's not important. It's religiously irrelevant that the Luther family throws away so many cats. <laughs> dead cats every month. So what are they doing with the dead cats? Who knows? Yeah. Darwin beats up puppies. Also, Darwin, as a child, used to lie a lot. These are his own words, right? I can, I can pull this straight out of his own diaries, his own letters, his own works, his own books. I may here also confess that as a little boy, I was much given to inventing deliberate falsehoods and this was always done for the sake of causing excitement so he admits that as a child he was a regular liar interesting but let's just say before someone says i took that out of context i'm taking one little thing and i'm going to embellish it no we're going to go in detail to the life of darwin and darwin's family his father his grandfather his children and yeah it's going to turn out a little bit like martin luther i think at the end of this you're going to find Darwin needs to have a seat maybe next to Hitler, between Hitler and Martin Luther. So, yeah, definitely doesn't sound like a psychopath. Darwin liked to kill things, too. How I did enjoy shooting. I must have been half consciously ashamed of my zeal. But notice, I became passionately fond of shooting. I did not believe that anyone could have shown more zeal for the most holy cause than I did for shooting birds. So, yeah, you once you start reading through... Look, this is not... He may have been a psychopath. Villainous, yeah, you're starting to read my mind. <laughs> There's definitely something wrong with the Darwin family. Okay, there are issues. So once I go through this, it is going to, it's going to present Darwin in a very different light than you've ever been exposed to. You're going to see Darwin in a whole new way. In fact, this little bit at the back here, this is Darwin's own handwriting. So it's actually taken, these are quotes taken from his own works and letters. So that's him actually saying this. Um, and in fact, you can see him say fun things like like, like this. Because Don is a good Christian. No, he wasn't. <laughs> that's another fun story that needs to die. So, you know, that's what Christians say. Science has nothing to do with Christ. I do not believe that there ever has been any revelation. So, yeah, so you, but this is, this is just one quote. So as I go through this in the future, we're going to go through loads of quotes. I'm going to be pulling up more and more and they'll build into themes and you're going to see how, what this is really, really like, what Darwin is really like and the impact he's had on the world. It's going to be eye opening. Um, so for instance, Darwin says the civilized races of man will almost certainly, almost certainly exterminate and replace 
the savage races throughout the world. Darwin was eugenicist, and Darwin, yeah, no, it's naive exactly because it's Darwin's own words, right? Darwin was a social Darwinist. He was the original social Darwinist, and uh, yeah, there, there's going to be some disturbing things about this family. Some very, very odd things about the evolution story. You're going to learn a few things that just. Um, <clears throat> Also, you'll find this in my archive, Hermes Trismegistus and the Origins of Gnosticism. Uh, well worth reading. I'm only, I've just started on this, so I'm just working my way through it now. Um, I've had some time today to have a look at it. And uh, yeah, but I'm working on this. But Hermes, so Hermeticism and Gnosticism are linked. Darwin doesn't represent Darwinism. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good argument, Vegetal. And we're going to discover just how little Darwin has to do with Darwinism. The holy cause, yes, of killing things. Joel, exactly. Hope you're well. I can't wait. Yes. So, um, yeah, we'll be talking about that at length. So, so let me go to my notes, um, ah, which is going to be this side. Um, right. So, welcome everyone. We're here to talk about Gnosticism, or nonsense, as we've been calling it. Just because Darwin is is, is named after Darwin doesn't mean. He Yes, and Islam has nothing to do with Islam, as we all discovered. Gnostic gnomes gnow nothing. Yes, what do we gnow? We don't gnow what they gnow. <clears throat> okay, so this is where we start. We stopped last time on slide 28. We stopped on the first of eight rough commonalities within um, within nonsense, right? Or nonsense. <clears throat> so henotheism. So it's not really... It's not really it's not the worship of multiple gods, right? Or polytheism, the worship of parrots. It's not that. It's actually henotheism. So let's let's fit, let's redo this slide since it's where I ended, and we'll continue. Uh, I plan to do twenty-two slides today, and I will do a third session next week. So eight concepts are common across many Gnostic groups, while by no means universal. These are eight commonly shared beliefs. The first is that the Gnostic idea of God is a hierarchical henotheism. And the creator god was called the Demiurge. Gnostics believe that there are many gods in the universe, but they only owe worship or allegiance to one. So they can pick that one. The allegiance is never to the creator god, the Demiurge, because the creator god, or what we call Yahweh of the Bible, is Satan. Within the pantheon, all the nonsense gods are fundamentally equal except for the amount of light that they contain. Do remember that you'll often hear people saying things like love and light, the new whole new age thing, love and light, I wish you love and light. Right? It's how they talk about, you know, sending you love and sending you light. As opposed to so they're not they're spiritual, but they're not Christian. They are Gnostics. They do not owe allegiance to Albert. Albert's the monad who has the most light. Gnostics can pledge allegiance to eons that specialize in wisdom, truth, light, repentance. Or personalities such as Messiah, Christ, Jesus, Yahweh, Adonai, fill in the blank, right? And it's love and light. We send you love and light. Knowledge, light, exactly, Joel. Right, now this conflicts directly with Judeo-Christian monotheism. Right? In, in fact, it also can be like a bit of a pantheism. But yeah. So I got a response from someone who seems to be a Gnostic, a guy called Pablo Mariani. And this was this morning, or yesterday, or last night. So, let's be blunt. Gnostics disrespect facts, history, and logic. Right? Can I call him Alberto? Y yes, you can call him Alberto, because it's a personal, subjective experience of the divine, okay? Ernesto, so yeah. James Alexander, oh, once again late. You're just a couple of minutes late. So, Pablo Mariani, I like your videos, but this one is 100% wrong. This is a comment on the very first Gnostic one we did last week, right? Okay, Shesh Bojer Lloyd. Okay, um, Dobre Vecho. So, hi, Synthesis, Corde, Yesu. Okay, fine, Latin. Um, so, Vitae. First time catching you live, Lloyd. What an honor. Against all evil. Well, thank you. Great. And uh, Sandro Carrea, welcome. Welcome all. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for, for being here. Much appreciate the company. All right. So, he says, you couldn't be more wrong. And yes, it's complicated and hermetic, but fundamentally Christian in its purest way so he's telling us that <laughs> this is christian now as we go through this because there'll be three parts and we're going to be going into islam quite a bit and linking this to islam and we're going to start looking this to the occult as well right? 
and this is anything but Christian, but this is his assertion. So I gave him some information. I said to him, um, Gnosticism shares some characteristics with Judaism and Christianity, but it's distinct from both. The earliest example of a group being described as Gnostic comes from the work of Irenaeus, right? Now, these are my citations, Pearson, Ancient Gnosticism, page 9, who described certain heretics as the Gnostic heresy. And Henry Moore coined the term Gnosticism in the 17th century to describe the heresy of the church in Theatera, right, which is in Revelation 2, 18 to 29, right? So that's a bit of background history, right? So you can look it up. I'm not going to go into that, that section. I looked at it. It's, uh, you can look up Revelation 2, verses 18 to 29. So Irenaeus spoke out harshly against the Gnostics. So the early church fathers, I said, viewed Gnostics as heretics. Here are some examples. Justin Martyr, who lived from roughly 100 to 165, his lost work, Compendium Against the Heretics, mentioned in Justin Martyr's First Apology, volume page 26, included arguments against Simon Magus and his disciple Meander, who were seen as proto-Gnostics. In his first apology, he says that the followers of Simon Magus worshipped him as a god, and that Meander persuaded his followers that they would not die. Now, Valena says, so blind. Yes, St. John's Gospel does rebuke the Gnostics. It, it is written almost explicitly to deal with Gnosticism. So what he's saying is that he wants to replace Christianity, just like Islam. Yes. So, um, Hegesippus, late 2nd century, mentions as heretical a variety of Gnostic groups and traces their origin back to Simon Magus. An excerpt of his work is preserved in Eusebius in Ecclesiastical History 4.22, right? In this passage, Hegesippus does not describe the teachings of the Gnostic groups in detail, but says that the founder of each group introduced his own opinion and that their teachers divided the church with doctrines against God and Christ. Time phaser, welcome. Michael Lawler, welcome. Irenaeus of Lyon, from 140 to 198, in his main work, Adverses Heresies, or Against Heresies, is dedicated to refuting Gnosticism. Hippolytus of Rome, from 170 to 235, his work Refutatio Omnium Heresium, or Refutation of All Heresies, argues against 33 Gnostic groups, as well as against some non-Gnostic groups. The early church fathers were dead set, dead set, against Gnosticism, against this nonsense, or nonsense. Right? Even, even the New Testament speaks, as we've shown, the New Testament speaks explicitly against the Gnostics, and the the Nicene Creed is explicitly written, if you've seen me talk about the Nicene Creed, is explicitly written against the Gnostics. The Bible got corrupted by some Jew, correct? Um, obviously, yeah, that's, that's, at least we know that for a fact from Martin Luther. Eusebius of Caesarea from 260 to 340 devotes a chapter of his ecclesiastical history to Gnostic groups, whom he rejects as false teachers. And for the most part, he does not describe or specifically refute their teachings in this section. However, he states that the Gnostic teacher, Basilides, invented prophets who had never existed, and that the Gnostic followers of Carpocrates required those who wanted to become full participants of their mysteries to practice various forms of wickedness, licentiousness, in order to escape what they called the cosmic powers. Epiphanius of Salamis from 310 to 403, in his work Panarion, or Medicine Chest, contained arguments against various heresies, including Gnostics. So I gave him this evidence, and of course, being a, a smart, intelligent, wise man, he replied with this. Lloyd, you are absolutely convinced you have the truth, my friend. There is nothing I can say to you, but you are wrong. And there is super clear cut who follows the Christian doctrine and who is anti-Christian, especially these days. You don't know everything. Be humble about it. It's not bullshit. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. So I gave him evidence from the early church fathers, from the early church. And yeah, I, what do you say to this, right? Yeah, try <laughs> vegetable <laughs> source, trust me, bro. <laughs> yes, exactly. His source is trust me, bro. Look, just ask them, what is the authority of the Gnostics? Can you trace your lineage back to the early church? Who in the early church was a Gnostic that teaches these Gnostic ideas of a walking, talking cross, for instance? Let me know. Uh, they're not going to be able to answer this for you. So, um, yeah. So, they, are, they have no respect for history. They have no respect for fact. This is not something that is important to them. Those things will go against them. So, therefore, they have to reject them. Thunderous, welcome. Okay, so, number two of eight commonalities. 
This is from the Sharia of Islam. Knowledge is in the way of Allah. Okay? And the way of Allah is jihad. So in other words, knowledge in Islam, knowledge is, is in the way of jihad. So jihad is knowledge. Okay? Killing people. Killing and being, being killed for Allah is knowledge. Right? This world and what is in it are accursed. And this is from the Sharia. So this is the final law, the final understanding of the Quran. That the world and what is in it is accursed, which aligns very well with the Gnostic idea that the world of matter is corrupt. And it also tells us that the religious scholar is greater in reward than the fighter in the way of Allah. So in Islam, the, the jihadi is supposed to have reward far greater than the average Muslim. But here, the Gnostic, the scholar who, who remembers Allah, right? Someone with the sacred knowledge or someone learning the knowledge is even greater than the jihadi. So they break the law of non-contradiction and claim it's not. Yes, exactly. The source is called the, the norm of Thyatira. Huh? Yeah. The nom. <laughs> nom, yeah. Interesting. Okay, so <clears throat> the new glove. There's a type of hypernominalism amongst the atheist and naturalist types. That alone debunks atheism. Yeah, atheism is incoherent garbage. Right. So the physical world and the body are corrupt. The physical world and the physical universe and all of creation are evil, the source of all corruption, according to the Gnostics. The apocalypse of Peter portrays Christ on the cross, glad and laughing, because he became a being released from the flesh. Right? That's actually a very interesting passage when you read that from the apocalypse of Peter. It's actually, it's kind of macabre how Jesus is laughing on the cross. Right? As a result, the Gnostic is constantly seeking release from the body. Right? So, for instance, men can pretend to be a woman or a furry by identifying, by imagination. See, fantasy beats reality. Fantasy beats fact, and logic, and science. So, they can identify because the spirit, their thoughts, because remember, they believe that their thoughts are the equivalent of spirit and that they are trapped. They're a deity, they're part of God, trapped in a physical body. So, apocryphal works, Islam's favorite source of knowledge, yes. Right. So the Gnostic mind sees nothing redeeming or beneficial with the flesh. The flesh and the world are weak, evil, illusionary, or illusory, and to be forever disdained. That's why they will carve kids up and say, well, you want to be a girl? Just do this. Or you want to be a boy? Just do that. It's a completely 100% natural evolutionary process involving surgery, medications, hormone treatments, knives, scalpels, doctors, and treatment for the rest of your life. So... Right. Now, this contrasts Orthodox Christianity, which says that when God created the world, it was very good. Genesis 1.31. So, let's have a look at commonality number three. So, let's look at this book from Ibn Qayyim, which is the, the second oldest and, the, well, one of the two most common polemics against Christianity and Islam. Still used today, still taught today. The fundamentals of the Christian religion are built on the vilification of God and joining partners to him and the fable of redemption. So Christianity insults God. Christianity is built on vilifying or making God evil, insulting him, and we have a fable of redemption. Sergeant Grinch, five push-ups. Let's have a look. Before the strayed people, the worshippers of the cross who've gone astray, and the images painted on the walls and the ceilings concoct something to defame the Muslims with, should not they first feel ashamed? These are the roots of those whose religion is entrenched in the belief that the Lord of the heavens and the earth descended from the authority of his greatness and throne and entered the vagina of a woman who eats, drinks, urinates, evacuates her bowels, and menstruates. So, understand, they are talking about a Gnostic God that does not come to earth, that does not enter into dirty matter, but also, in Islam, Evacuates her bowels, that's pooping, menstruates, that's blood, and urinates. Those are the three most dirty things in Islam. And those are things that can keep you from actually going to paradise. Right. Then he get, got attached to the inside of her abdomen, her uterus, and dwelt there for nine months, wobbling between excrement, urine, and menstrual blood. So they're speaking here of Jesus right, being born, and this would never be something that God would stoop to, because in the Gnostic view... God would never condescend to come to earth as matter. That's why God had to be, or Jesus had to be, a, an apparition, 
not a real thing. Yeah, this disrespect, exactly. And oddly enough, yeah, this, this continues then into other religions that, that also, that all the flesh is evil, therefore there's no bearing on what is true or false. I want to adapt to this way of thinking today. Yeah, yeah, Pedro Jr. One has to wonder who could that be, right? Let's continue. So, within Gnosticism, there is no incarnation of divinity and no resurrection. And this is also true of Islam. For surely they killed him not. Isa, son of Maryam, Quran 4, 157. They say, Allah, most gracious, has begotten a son, Quran 19, 88. It is not appropriate for the most merciful that he should take a son, Quran 19, 92. There is no Christmas and no Easter. These are blasphemy in Gnosticism. Uh, this description denigrates God's plan for reproduction in man, yeah, because, yeah, all babies would be subject to that, and therefore all babies are filthy. Because, I mean, they say it's even worse for God, but yeah, this is, right? A God would never condescend to be trapped in corrupt human flesh. In Christian Gnostic sex, no, no Christmas, because Christmas is the birth, right, of Jesus. So bringing babies into the world is to increase the corruption in the world. And therefore, you know, if you kill the babies, that's good, and no Easter, right? So... Yeah, so this is all corruption because Jesus didn't have a body. Jesus didn't die. In Christian Gnostic sects, quote-unquote Christian, Christ was not a God or he was an eon who manifested but not in the flesh. Right? He was an eon who manifested but not in the flesh. Likewise, there is no resurrection of the body for the dead because the point of Gnosticism is to shed the flesh, not to replace it. You are trapped in a prison of flesh. You need to escape the prison of flesh. This, if you would think about this, take it to its logical conclusion consistently in terms of its thinking, means that Gnosticism ultimately is a death cult. It is a death cult. And we'll discuss that more as we go. Right? Islam is a death cult because they believe that in jihad, killing you is to do you a mercy. David Sands, good point. Anybody else notes how haughty these cheap impressions of God tend to be? Yes, because it's pride. It's Gnosticism. <clears throat> Trans people are modern Gnostics. Good point, exactly. That's that's what Belinus was, was hinting at and others. So, they claim a spiritual resurrection inaugurated or initiated by a secret knowledge of perfection through spiritual alchemy. This is all very important, especially when I get into part three. It's going to get a lot more complicated. I mean, it's still a simple level, but it's going to get more detailed. But this is all a spiritual alchemy, and this must be kept in mind. This is a It's a transformation based on a ritual. So, Number four, secret knowledge saves. By learning the secret knowledge that only believers in nonsense have, you unlock the mysteries of the universe. So secret knowledge is what saves you, not God's love, not grace, not, no. The knowledge, you being so smart, you being special because you got given special knowledge. The knowledge is the key to transcend the world and return to the gods. Only those who are inducted, yes, it's esoteric, John McDermott, exactly, it's esoteric. Only those who are inducted into the mysteries are said to be able to understand the secret knowledge. That's a good point, Love. Yes, Gnosticism distinguishes enlightened and ignorant. So, Orthodox Christianity is about who you know, this being Jesus. Nonsense is about what you know. This is the hikmah, or the wisdom. And the hikmah is what the Muslims refer to, and I will be going into depth in that a bit later on, right? the hikmah, the wisdom. Those who don't know the secret knowledge cannot ascend into the heavens when they die, but they are sucked into the whirlpool that lies below the earth and they are lost forever. Right? So, secret knowledge. So the only sin is ignorance. Number five, there's an antinomian ethic. So, antinomianism means simplified without law or lawless now because the world is already evil it doesn't matter how you behave or how you live because the gnostics behavior cannot make it better or make it worse arnold nathaniel welcome good to see you all right let me let me actually just load this up on i need to explain this point actually no let me just go back here to my slides so i can There we go. 
Let me go back here. Okay, so because the world is already evil, it doesn't matter how the Gnostic behaves, because the Gnostic's behavior cannot make it better or worse. And we'll have to explain that. Because nonsense, at the end of the day, is indifferent to God's moral law at best. Now, they may claim to be moral, they may claim to be X, they may claim to be Y, they may claim to be Z, but once you follow the logic of what they believe, because don't forget, only spirit is pure, the monad is pure, the monad is distant, the monad is is disembodied, not attached, and the monad is not a, is not a personality. It has, Albert has no personality. Albert just emanates stuff, mindlessly emanates things. He just Things just kind of pop out of him. There you go, something new came out of him, right? So, Albert, no personality. And the world is made by an evil god, Satan. So, therefore, the moral laws of God are evil. Okay, let's have a look at this. So, asceticism and licentiousness are examples of Gnostic rejection of the world. Although they represent opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of behavior, Asceticism is the practice of severe self-discipline and abstention from worldly pleasures, often in the pursuit of spiritual or religious goals. Gnostics who practice asceticism reject the material world and its desires. They believe that the physical realm is inherently corrupt or evil. And don't forget, we just saw in Islam that they believe that the physical world is corrupt, is, it is cursed. By denying themselves worldly pleasures and focusing on spiritual purification, ascetics seek to detach themselves from the material world or the good world that God made. They want to detach themselves from this world and separate right, and attain higher spiritual knowledge or salvation. This rejection of the world is based on the belief that the physical realm and its desires are distractions or obstacles to true enlightenment. So they want to be detached and freed from the physical, from the real. Therefore, they have to go into the unreal. Remember the Gnostics, the Sufis, for instance, when they practice these rituals, they leave the rational mind behind and they have to assume what they call um, pre-rational and post-rational states. They detach from logic. Yes, Muslims often say you need to speak to scholars, men of knowledge, to get answers. Right? So, licentiousness, on the other hand, refers to excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. Think Maki Desad, disregarding moral or ethical restraints. Now, some Gnostics, particularly those influenced by antinomian tendencies, believe that since the material world was inherently corrupt or evil, they could freely engage in immoral behavior without any consequences. They rejected the laws and moral codes upheld by mainstream society and religious institutions. Because these institutions, these moral laws, are part of the false, corrupt, ignorant world. So by indulging in licentious behavior, immoral behavior, they sought to demonstrate their freedom from the constraints of the material realm and its moral codes. Think about that. This is exactly what we're seeing today, right? Someone asks, which category are the Sufis on the Sunni or the Shia side? Both. They are the bridge between the two. They're considered the bridge between Sunni and Shia. That's where they merge. So asceticism, yeah, look, we're talking about Gnostic forms of this. We're not talking about Christians, right? So this is clearly, it's a corruption of everything. It's a simulacrum of everything. Robert said, you're still in time. We've been going about, I don't know, 15 minutes, I don't know, half an hour, whatever. Um, maybe less. Right. Let me continue. So I'll close this. That's done. So understand, Gnosticism is indifferent. Nonsense to God's, is indifferent to God's moral law at best. Now, this is contra to the Christian message of if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. And notice it doesn't say you'll have faith. It says keep his commandments. Commandments is stuff that you do. Baptism, the first baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Sounds very Christian. Okay, So the Gnostic view of baptism, the first baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Sounds very Christian, but sin is redefined. Sin is the ignorance that inhibits upward progress. That word progress we hear so often, progressives. So this prevents us from our exodus from the world into the eon, leaving the world behind, entering into the world of the imagination, this mythical Place they go to. Right? So, this anti God dualistic cosmology of this good mythical realm with the with Albert, the mindless Albert, and the evil of the material world that we live in, right? This cosmology that they have, this, this dualistic universe, affects its ethics. That's why women are not safe because they have small brain, unlike as many of, yeah. Uh, we spoke about that, how Gnostics don't know what to do with women because women are evil. Women are the weakest, the worst, the most corrupt, which is exactly the kind of thing Muhammad says about women. Right? 
Right, number six, the magical worldview and practice. So widespread across the Mediterranean in the first centuries AD, there is evidence. Okay, so the magical worldview and magical practice were widespread across the Med in the first century AD, or the early centuries. There's evidence of Christians using magic in this period. So much secret knowledge passed from teacher to student as magical incantations to manipulate the gods for higher access into the Pleroma. The Pleroma is, where, is basically a version of heaven, right? the fullness. And Islam has huge amounts of magic. Hi, Synthus. Thank you very much for joining. Much appreciated. All right. So now, these magical incantations could secure a Gnostic's ascended spirit a place closer to the light further away from the material world. Right? But of course, to do this, you need to know the secret names of God. Right? You need to know the secret name of, of the eon to let you through into the next level and the next level and the next level. And then you have to know the secret name so you could manipulate that particular deity. Right? <coughs> and notice again, Allah doesn't have a 99 names. Right? When you say he's merciful, he's kind, or he's... He's a big, you know, he's a big teddy bear. That's a description. That's not a name. Okay. Albert is a name. Right. We don't know the name of God. Allah, the La, is a descriptor. It is not a name. Allah has a secret name, has a hundredth name, which is secret, not known to you. Right. But there's a story to that secret name. So we'll discuss that another time. So the Gospel of the Egyptians is a late Sethite text. Seth, that's the child of Adam used magical incantations by revealing the hidden names of the eons. <clears throat> These hidden names are often derived from acrostics, equidistant letter sequencing or through the manipulation of pronunciation. We'll discuss that more, but this is something that is common within Islam. Actually, let me, let me go to there. Let me actually bring up my, my reference here. Right, so they do a particular kind of a magic. Onomatomancy. Okay, here we go. Onomatomancy. So this is the Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume Thirteen. It's the index. It's like the dictionary of the uh, of the the, the set. Okay. Ilm al huruf or the akhruf, right? In Islam, they speak of the akhruf, the different readings of the. Quran, right? The, the 7 or the 14 or the 10, or you pick your number. Maybe it's 93 today, but onomatomancy, a magical practice based on the occult properties of the letters of the alphabet and of the divine and angelic names which they form. It's called letter magic. Letter, not word magic, but letter magic. Manipulation of the letters. Names have power and all that. Exactly. Murad was saying he found lots of incantations in the Quran as he was translating. Exactly. And this is something I've been saying for about two years, that the Quran is a book of incantations, a book used to make spells. Now, he's confirming that, which is fantastic, and I'd love to see more of what Murad is finding. But those 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 unknown names, Alif, Lim, Mam, and all those things that people have not translated because they supposedly are, make no sense, the garbage, those are the incantations that the Sufis use, right? So they speak of acrostics and letter sequencing and manipulation of pronunciation, which is why you've got the Tajweed, right? Where they, where they speak in a very particular way, Allah, and you've got to talk in a very particular way. That's why they have these weird pronunciations, these Muslims, right? Understand. So they've got this whole sequence. It's all magic in your face that you don't realize. Now, hidden names to control divinity is a Near Eastern practice from at least the time of the pyramid texts. Now we're going back to the Hermetics. Now we're going back to Egypt. In text 534, the gods are prevented from their evil coming by using their hidden names. Dragon, welcome, very welcome. <clears throat> right, let me, let's have a look. Let not Osiris come in this, he's evil coming. Do not open to him thine arms. Let him be gone. Let him go at once. Let him be gone. This is an anti-Osirian pyramid text verse. Utterance number 534. See, so this idea of utilizing this goes back to the pyramid text, and this has now embedded itself within Islam as well. Right, Samia, right? So this is the Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume 9, page 627. Usually when I give a page reference, it's in the PDF, not in the book. Right? Samia, in form like Kibriya, belongs to Old Arabic, 
right? It's a name for certain genres of magic, letter magic. We would think of it as conversational hypnosis, right? It's a way of hypnotizing someone using plain speech, right? So it comes to us through the Syriac, semia, plural, and means signs, letters of the alphabet. But that's where we get the achruf. See, so when we look here again, let me go back to this. <coughs> when you look at the idea of achruf, Muslims want to tell you that harf, okay? Plural, achruf. Achruf is plural, harf is singular. Letter of the alphabet, word. Yes, it means those things. In grammar, right, it means articulation of the Arabic language, a Quranic reading, a dialect. Yes, it is those things. That is true. However, when you look further down, these are minor definitions. These are very short definitions. The longer one, if we go to volume 3, page 595b, and I've done that on my channel quite often, you will notice there are earth letters, sun letters, divine letters, star letters. It's all to do with calling up demons to manipulate them using theom what, the thaumaturgy or whatever, whatever theology, whatever. It's, it's calling up spirits to control them and make them do things for you and all that. This is the actual major definition here, okay, of cult magic. So it goes on. The science, ilm, was invented in the time of Moses. And who else was around at the time of Moses, according to the legend? Hermes Trismegistus, a contemporary of Moses, right? And we've got this guy, but, and then the name of Allah and the names of, of Allah certainly play a large part in Semiya. So now we've got this letter magic or word magic, and the names of Allah and the name of Allah, which we don't know what that name is, right, play a large part in Samia. And you've got here to two quite different branches of magic, widely applied at the present day, what is called natural magic, but is evidently hypnotism. So it's conversational magic. It is being able to manipulate people. Propaganda, effectively. We know it as Dawa. Dawa is a form of magic spells, casting magic spells to cloud men's minds. Isn't political propaganda type of spell casting? Hitler whipping up the masses. Well, dawa is political speech. Dawa is literally propaganda. Remember, if you go through the um, Encyclopedia of Islam, you go through the proper definitions. Dawa is discussed as political propaganda. Right? So, <clears throat> dawa lawsuit. I mean, to go, let me just do this again. Um, dawa is propaganda. Okay, dawahi. For some reason, they've skipped dawa here. Oh, here we go. Dawa. So Dawa is a call. It is an invitation. But notice it says here, Dawa is propaganda. See? Letter magic. It is spell casting. To cloud your mind, to manipulate your mind, take over your mind using Islamic magic. So propaganda, notice pretension, to pretend. Right? Effectively, to pretend. So understand what Dawa is. It is them casting a magic spell on you. Right? Natural magic, which is hypnotism, and the science of the secret powers of letters is Samia. The science of the secret powers of letters. So, yeah. Does that make sense, guys? Does that does that make sense to you what Dawah is and what Muslims are doing? They're casting spells in the world. They are doing ritual magic. This is from the Egyptian pyramid text from Homis Trismegistus, made its way into Islam, and they are doing magic on you. Right. So the speaker, Ibn Khaldun, expresses it very clearly as a working of the nafs of the magician. The nafs is the spirit of the magician, right? The nafs would be, think of it as the chakras, if you want. You can look at it in that sense, right? The chakras, right? The, his, his spirit, right? His soul. His, uh, yeah. So the nafs of the magician on the imagination of his subject, conveying certain ideas and forms, which are then transferred to the senses of the subject and objectify themselves externally in appearances, which have no external reality whatever that means but understand it's nlp it's hypnotism think of it as nlp very very smart nlp hypnotism right muhammad hijab taking off his shirt i uh, i don't know that that's him that that's him there's a word for that um it's um it's it's um ah, when i get the word i'll thank you Stephen Young, thank you for this amazing content, Lord. You've changed the way I look, uh, look at a lot. Thank you. That's really good to know. Thank you. I much appreciate that. Arnold Nathaniel Dawi, thank you for that connection, Lord. Great. Excellent. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so they speak of the extremist school of Sufis who professed to be able to control the material world by means of these letters and the names and figures compounded from them. So now you've got this whole magical rituals they can do to literally control the world. It was thus considered 
a possible study and practice for pious Muslims, but the Sufis who took it up were the speculative and pantheistic school and claimed control of the elemental world and the power to invade its order and asserted that all existence descended in a certain sequence from a unity, the Neoplatonic chain. When we get to Darwin, we're going to be talking about this. Weirdly enough, once we get to Darwin, this stuff is going to come up. It's crazy how this is connected to Darwin. <laughs> in this system, the entelechy, or the Kamal of the divine names, proceeds from the help of the spirits of the spheres and of the stars. What? So this is paganism. Understand how Islam is now... These, these the, the highest scholars, the literally top echelon at the pyramid of scholars in Islam, these guys are now talking about the spirits of the spheres and the stars. This is Gnostic language. And Islam is hypnotizing its followers, exactly. Sister in Christ, he said Dawah in Arabic, because Dawah can also mean medicine. Not this one, no, not in this. Uh, yeah, it's clear, I'm just joking. Thank you, have you worried there for a second? Because I, because you know, they're going to say, Lloyd doesn't speak Arabic. Yeah, I don't speak a lot of languages. So, okay. So, and the letters circulate in the names built out of them. So natures and secret powers of the letters. That's so, so people go on about, oh, no, the Jews, you know, they do, they, they do like this gematria with the numbers and they got like this magic with the words. These guys are off the charts with that stuff. Understand? The Muslims are off the charts in terms of their magic. You understand? This is, this goes well beyond anything I've ever seen for anything to do with those evil Jews, okay? So, whatever. So, anyway, I'll leave this at that. So, they speak of the primal secrets of creation and the secret powers. And the primal secrets of creation takes us to evolution, believe it or not. But we'll be talking about that when we talk about Darwin. It's, it's not as directly... So, these ideas come out of the Gnostics. But these ideas made their way to the Greeks, and made their way to the Romans. And then, of course, the Muslims stole them and did their little magic on them. So... So some, some fool in Egypt one day wrote something, said something, whatever. And then the Greeks came along, changed it, copied it, edited it, whatever. Did their Photoshop on it and then blah, blah, blah. And then like later Greeks came along, changed it again, made it to suit themselves. Then the Romans came, made a change. And then the Muslims came and made a change. And then it went to Europe in the 1500s and they did some wank, wacky stuff with it. And the story has mutated beyond all recognition. Anyway, but that we'll talk about hermeticism another time. But then it goes to Darwin, and it becomes evolution. We'll talk about that in the future. Okay, the Gospel of the Egyptians and Seth. So the Gospel of the Egyptians is the name given to two separate works, wholly independent of each other. Right? You have the Coptic Gospel of the Egyptians, which focuses on the Gnostic interpretation of the Biblical Seth. And then you've got the Greek Gospel of the Egyptians, which is a dialogue on the merits of celibacy. <clears throat> Romeo and Yaakov, welcome. So Seth is the son of Adam and Eve, and he's the third named in the scripture. He was born after Cain murdered Abel in Genesis 4.8. And Eve believed that God had appointed him as a replacement for Abel and named him Seth, which means set in place of, the replacement of, right? Genesis 4.25. Later, when Seth was 105 years old, his son Enosh was born, Enoch. Genesis 4.26, and Enosh continues what is sometimes called the godly line of Seth that leads to Abraham. Right? Father Makri in Egypt was proof enough of how Muslims practice magic. He drove out more devils from them than the Christians in his church. Yeah, yeah so Islam is steeped in the occult. We, we must understand this. When you go through the Encyclopedia of Islam, like 40% of the references have some sort of occult magical connection. It's crazy. How much of Islam is directly occultic in your face and you don't even know it. So the story of Cain's killing the righteous seed Abel and God's raising up another seed Seth becomes the central theme of the divine plan. Evil is always attempting to rid the world of good and God is always thwarting evil's plans. This unfortunately makes its way, this Gnostic idea makes its way into Christian apologetics. You'll say, well, you know, um, a mass murderer came along, murdered all my family, raped my wife, raped my daughter, killed them in front of me, burned down my house, chopped off both my feet, both my arms, and now I'm a paraplegic, I'm broke, I have no family, and I have to live on the street. And everyone says, well, you know, um, God brings good out of bad things. You know, maybe it was a good thing, you know, because because who knows what, what good thing was. Look, I don't want to hear that ever again. The next person who tells me that, if ever in the chat, I'm banning them because I'm not interested in listening to that nonsense. Because look, your house is not supposed to burn down. You're not supposed to have your family killed, murdered, raped. Okay, when that happens, yes, it happens, life sad, but this is not what is good. 
right? These are unfortunate things. And yes, we try to do the best. If your house burns down, you try to build your house back. But that's a setback. That's a problem, right? You want your house to remain intact. You want your family to remain intact. That would be the good. Evil happening is not good. That is, you, you try to recover from the evil. You lose your job. You go broke. You try to find a new job. You try to recover from that. But that is not necessarily a good thing. Yes, evil is stupid. Okay. Right. So an analysis of Islam as a German and British scholars were doing some fantastic work in terms of understanding Islam. But then all this got forgotten in the late 1800s, 1900s, as well, especially with World War One, a lot of this research just got forgotten, got derailed, and then World War Two derailed it again, and it just got forgotten. A lot of scholarship today is just repeating what German and British scholars did 200 years ago. Right? So let's have a look at this one. This one goes way back. I can't remember who wrote it, but um, let's have a look here. So this is within Islam. Islam as a system, former revelations. So even back in what, the 1800s, they knew that abrogation was a thing. The Germans have and still are doing amazing work in Islam. Yeah, they, true. They, they do. They've done some of the best work around, except it's in German. That's the problem. Okay. Then they speak of the Quran, the book and the man. The book and the man. And then notice it says here, there are other authorities. Other authorities. Interesting. And then they mention here the other authorities. Okay. They speak here of the Hadiths. Records of what Muhammad did. The Sunat al-Fa'il. Records of what Muhammad enjoined or commanded. Sunat al-Qa'l, and records of what Muhammad allowed, Sunat al-Takrir, and Qa'l actually is the name of a, of, a, of a god of Arabia, of a pagan god of Arabia. And among the Sunnis, you've got the Ijma, or unanimous consent of the leading companions, that's the consensus, and the Qiyas, the deductions of the orthodox teachers from the sources of Imams, beginning with Ali, who interpret the sources. And notice they say here, not one of them flourished until three centuries after Muhammad. Here they're speaking of the Hadiths. Not one of them flourished until three centuries later. So they're all very, very late. They're speaking here of Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, An Nasai, and Ibn Majah. Those are the six Kitab al Sitta. Vegetal, yes, the stream is probably buffering only for you. Where's the diagram from, Lloyd? Uh, that, I have spoken about it in the past. I have. Arabia, the cradle of Islam. Israeli. Okay, give me a second. I will. Elf, Arabia, Cradle of Islam, Israel. Let's go. Studies in the geography, people, and politics of the peninsula with an account of Islam and mission work. He was a missionary. And this was written when? He lived from 1867 to 1952. So this goes back to the late 1800s. Something like that. Yeah, this will go back 1900. So this was published in 1900. There's probably a couple of editions. Um, yeah, it's too late for me to make any changes to the settings if it is buffering. Okay, a lot of people are buffering. Let me go and see if I can fix that. Yes, it's buffering. Give me one second. My internet's obviously suffering from something. Let me see if I can repair that. Ah, I can't change the latency now. I, I cannot change the stream settings. Not there. Let me see if I can do something on this end. At the risk of... Um... Okay. I have tried to adjust my stream, so please let me know if that helps. But uh, yes, I do notice there is a buffering issue that we seem to be having. Okay, does that fix it? Does that help with the buffering? Yeah, but YouTube does this to me. I don't know why. Um, YouTube does this. Let me just do it. Speed test to make sure that everything is hunky dory. So I have to wait for the download section of that. Let me continue while I'm here. All right. So hopefully that answers the question about where I got that source. 
Okay, so let me close that. <clears throat> right, and notice Allah has 99 names. The speaker of Allah, his names, his attributes, and his nature. Okay, notice Allah's nature is expressed by a series of negations. Allah is not. Allah is not. These are not positive. These are negative. Right? Allah is not. And then you've got Allah's attributes, the physical emphasized above the moral, the deification of absolute force. Yeah, my, my speed is good. My internet speed is definitely good. Um, so I've got really good speed. Um, anyone else has honestly, it's just one of those things that happens, unfortunately. So notice with Allah, the physical is emphasized above the moral and they deify absolute force, jihad. And notice Allah has 99 names. What is fascinating is Muhammad has 201 names and titles. Right. And don't forget, Allah has 99 descriptions. Right. He's fluffy. He's friendly. He's warm. He's funny. Right. Those are not names. Those are descriptors. Right. So notice Muhammad has over 200 names. Allah has 99. Who do you think is more important? Muhammad or Allah? Then in terms of the Gnostic side, notice Muslims believe that 104 books were sent from heaven in the following order to Adam with 10 books. So Adam somehow got 10 books. Seth got 50 books. Enoch got 30 books. Abraham received 10 books from Allah. Moses got the Torah, but notice the 10 books of Adam, the 50 books of Seth, the 30 books of Abraham, uh, sorry, the 10 books of Abraham, the 30 books of Enoch are all utterly lost. So Muslims somehow forgot to tell you that not only was the Injil lost, but all of these books are also lost that they claim existed. So Moses has the Torah, David brought the Zabur, right, the, the Psalms, and Jesus the Injil, which they also don't have. So yeah. Okay, any questions or comments about that so far? Did I miss anything at all? All right. Okay, so this is a little bit about Islam. So understand this whole bit about Allah can't keep his book. No, Allah is constantly, he's not a very good librarian. Okay. So Momo is Allah, so he has 201 plus 99 names. Yeah, he's got 300. Yeah. All right. So let's continue. So this is the expanse. This is what the Pleroma looks like, at least according to some expressions of it, illustrations of it. The expanse amidst the waters. So you have waters above the expanse, waters below the expanse, waters above the expanse. Genesis 1.6. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the water. And let it separate the waters from the waters. And God called the expanse the heavens, right? So this is how they try to illustrate what is the expanse and what is, yeah. Uh, Martin Luther has 99 health issues. Martin Luther was a very sick man. Martin Luther was sick through his entire life. The propaganda around him tried to portray him as a very healthy, fit, vital man. But no, Luther was a very sick individual physically. And as was Charles Darwin. People didn't realize Charles Darwin, his whole family, Charles Darwin actually said, because he's fa he actually said, my fa we ought to be exterminated. He actually said that about his family. So here you've got the Gnostic cosmos. You've got the one, the parent, the heavenly Anthropos. We'll talk about that another time. Ialdaba Oath, okay? Archie Genitor, or whatever the heck that means. And yeah, this makes no sense, okay? This is, was constipation on that list? Of course it was, and so was syphilis. So, is the rapture nonsense? Okay, someone told me Rit, that Darwin is similar to Hitler. Maybe I said that. <laughs> Nick, you never know. You never know. You might start to find some similarities and overlaps. You never know. Or he might have been the spiritual ins inspiration of good old Hitler. You never know. You never know. You know, because maybe Hitler wasn't corrupting Darwin's teachings. Maybe Hitler was literally just applying Darwin's teachings to the letter, faithfully. Just like he was applying Martin Luther's teachings, faithfully, to the letter. Okay? So, <laughs> radio. Okay, so... Um, the Gnostics believe that when all elect Gnostics are restored through the Gnosis, the physical world will be destroyed and the chosen humans will return to their divine state. Right? This is in Pearson, Ancient Gnosticism, pages 13 to 14. So salvation is initially via the Gnosis, but ultimately it means a return of the human soul to the divine realm in which it belongs because your soul, that shard of your soul, actually is part of the of Albert, right? You are a part of Albert. You are divine. You are a god. They want to become gods. Exactly, Joel. So this is what happens. So once they 
See, so if they can revert everyone to the null, to the gnosis, right? Once everyone has the knowledge, the world will be destroyed. So that's why under communism and all these things, they actually were, these were death cults. They want to destroy the world because that will free all of the trapped souls. That's why jihad kills because it frees trapped souls. They may not know they're doing this. It might be a corruption of that Gnostic idea, but this is the source of that idea. Early church fathers, such as Irenaeus, deemed Gnosticism heretical. Yaakov, this is exactly what Hinduism believes. That's interesting. Tell me some more about that. So Darwinism is the atheist religious creation story where only the fittest have value. Yeah, it's pretty nasty. Darwinism is nasty stuff. We're going to go through that. Yeah, Lenin said it himself. He wanted to blow up the universe. Yeah, it's a death cult. Socialism is a death cult, right? This sounds very much like what the U.S. pay prosperity. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, there's, yeah, it's, you'll find as you, I need to do a talk on, on Christian, quote unquote, Gnosticism at some point. Nonsense shares some characteristics with, with Judaism and Christianity, but it's distinct from either. The earliest example of a group described as Gnostic comes from the work of Irenaeus, right? Who described certain heretics as the Gnostic heresy. So it's not Christian. Henry Moore coined the term Gnosticism in the 17th century to describe the heresy of the church in Thyatira, Revelations 2, 18 to 29. I don't know if it's really relevant for us to go there, but I'll just quickly bring this up. Um, and onto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. Okay? And, yeah, I will cast into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, and so on. Okay, so this is, God's obviously not happy with this Gnostic nonsense. So therefore, this other fool cannot claim that it is Christian because God is clearly very unhappy with that stuff. Prosperity preaching could be casting spells. And that's a really interesting observation there. That's a very interesting observation, Villanus. And Yaakov says, Hindus believe that they are a little part of ultimate reality. They call it the Brahman or Albert. Yep, they will then return and merge with Brahman when they die. So they believe that all things are divine. Yes, it's Gnosticism. Hinduism is Gnosticism. So is Buddhism, right? Some more than others versions of it. So Gnostics, like Mormons and Muslims, claim they are Christian, or in fact, the true Christians. So now the church fathers are against Gnosticism. I read this in the beginning, so I'm not going to repeat it now, okay? Because I, I gave this. This was part of this, the research I was doing. And that's what I gave in the beginning as a response to that idiot who claimed that the Gnostics are the original true Christians. Right. So the origins of nonsense. So Epiphanius of Salamis, in his work Medicine Chest, contained arguments against various heresies, including the Gnostics. Origen and Tertullian wrote against nonsense as well. However, they themselves held some beliefs rejected by the other church fathers and rejected by the church. Right. Now, until the discovery of the Nag Hammadi text, early Christian writings against Gnosticism were our main source of information about nonsense beliefs. The overall picture of Gnosticism provided by these texts that came out of the Nag Hammadi library have been confirmed by the Gnostic texts, right? Found at Nag Hammadi. So the, so the polemical texts written by the early church fathers were confirmed. So Stephen Young says, I'm struggling with the idea that Allah created the physical world if he is the Gnostic God. Can't Gnostics say Satan created the world? That's true, but you must understand Gnostics pick and choose. Okay, it's DIY religion. It's DIY religion of me. I make it up. I like it. Pick and choose. Do this. Do that. Do the other thing. So understand it. Islam is a is syncretic. These people are syncretic. They don't have to make sense. They're not required to. They're not following logic. They're not following non-contradictory logic. They're making a myth. They're telling them a nice themselves a nice story that makes them sleep better at night. It's lunch buffet theology. Thank you, J Park one three two, right. So according to Irenaeus, Simon Magus was the one from whom all the heresies take their origin. That's Irenaeus at verses Heresis 123.2. All right. However, we can go prior to Simon Magus. Okay, we, we can certainly trace it back a little further. Simon Magus was a sorcerer found in Samaria by Philip. He worked wonders among the people before Philip converted him to Christianity in Acts 8.13. After his conversion, Simon attempted to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit with money Yes, Simon the sorcerer from Peter before being rebuked. Okay, and that's where we get the word simony from, trying to buy your way to heaven, trying to buy grace. Right? So that was simony. So number seven, syncretism, Gnostic plagiarism. 
So Gnosticism has the unique ability to appropriate, to steal, plagiarize the writings of other religions and appropriate them as Gnonsen's teachings. Religious trappings and symbols are assimilated into the Gnonsen's mythological system. It's myth. They know it's myth. Right? They're making it up. They're making up a story that makes them happy. It's a bedtime story for stupid people. Sounds like the MO of Momo joke, correct? Right? So they've adapted baptism, the Eucharist, and worship services. We saw the baptism becomes the baptism of knowledge, not the baptism of the church, right, with water and the spirit. The reason it can do this is because of what is called its allegorical hermeneutic. Right? So the allegorical hermeneutic. So it takes all of these ideas and it absorbs them, just like Islam has absorbed Judaism, absorbed Christianity, absorbed paganism, paganism absorbed hermeticism, absorbed Gnosticism, pulled it into itself and made it part of its myth. Okay? Just like Muhammad assimilated surrounding religions. Yes, villainous, exactly so, exactly so. It doesn't have clear delineations. It's actually very flexible and open, right? So, <clears throat> so that's a flavor of Gnosticism. Yes, um, Stephen Young. So... So, hermeneutic is the theory and practice of interpretation involving the understanding and uncovering of meaning within texts, symbols, and cultural phenomena. That's how the goalposts keep changing. They'll just keep reinterpreting. They'll just keep reinterpreting. That's all. They'll just keep re When you've proven they're wrong, they'll just go and reinterpret it another way. Is Mormonism gnosis? gnosis? There's a lot of nonsense. Exactly. It is nonsense. Correctly so. Yes. So, some scholars have used the term symbiosis rather than syncretism. Okay? Instead of saying they make a soup, they say they are symbiotic. But don't forget, symbiosis can be parasitic. This is a parasitic symbiosis. It would not exist, and it cannot exist, without the underlying religion there first. It latches on, steals things, and sucks it to death. That's, that's really, it sucks it dry. It takes all the blood out. Okay? So, this is end of part one. Part two is allegorical hermeneutic, and it's not five slides. I've extended this quite, quite a bit now. Uh, so guys, it's one hour that we've been going. Shall I go a few minutes longer? Would you like me to go more into the allegorical hermeneutic? I can do a few minutes more. So Gnosticism is the basis of satanic works against Jesus. Yes, it, it, most certainly we will see how we get there. Right. So shall I go another few minutes? Okay. Uh, yeah, is the pace okay? Not too fast, not too slow, and you guys are learning something. Ten more minutes won't hurt. Okay, my throat, you know, that hurts. Uh, Okay, great stuff. Okay, fine. I guess that's a yes. <clears throat> Hopefully this is all tying together, right? Hopefully you're starting to see logic in terms of how this relates to things happening in the world today, right? So let's look at number eight. So this is similarity number eight with Gnostic systems. We wouldn't mind another hour. Yeah, I know. But um, yeah, when I go too long and people complain, if I go too short, people complain. So what do I do? So the allegorical hermeneutic. Much of the success of Gnosticism sorry, Gnosticism, I mean, that might be a typo or maybe not, depended upon this allegorical hermeneutic. And this critical feature deserves some attention. We're going to learn this by looking at Mary had a little lamb. All right. So in the exegesis on the soul, for instance, in Hosea 27, 222 to 7. Okay. So in the exegesis on the soul, right, in the Bible, right, the writer takes portions of the Bible dealing with adultery, sorry, so, Gnostics, in exegeting the soul, they take portions of the Bible dealing with adultery, like Hosea 2 and Ezekiel 16, and they interpret the woman of the passage as a metaphor for the soul, speaking not just of the prostitution of the body, but especially the prostitution of the soul. That's a basic exegesis, okay? Taking this and interpreting it differently. Instead of saying, well, you know, um, you know, it's it's really not, you know, when jihad says strike at their necks and kill them, what it really means is, you know, sit them down, talk to them, offer them some lunch, maybe give them a foot rub, and then and then tell them they love their lovely people and invite them to Islam. Understand, this is the kind of exegesis that is done, the kind of interpretation. Remember, Muslims, it's how it's interpreted. They mean allegorical hermeneutic. Right. <clears throat> So some Gnostics argue that Simon Magus was reviving the cult of Aphrodite, which would be very interesting. That's also linked to Islam. Metaphor is commonly used when they want to practice DIY. Exactly, it's DIY religion of me, right? So they love their nonsensical eisegesis. They do. Jihad just means going to the gym or doing homework. Exactly, 
Exactly, Stephen. So, now the difficulties that surround the study of Gnonsens are largely caused by its allegorical hermeneutic. Because the goalposts keep moving. Whatever you think they meant, or say, they say they meant, or you say they meant, no, they meant something else, right? Because it's not always clear how the believers in Gnonsens are reading their texts. Because they don't want to be pinned down. They don't want to give you a clear, logical, consistent answer. There is no consistency. You understand? One plus one could be five tomorrow, could be 37 and a half the day after that, and could be 2.6 five minutes from now. Yes, make sure you hide on the like button. That would be very appreciated. I hope you guys are learning something, something of value, and um, taking something away from this. All right, so... <clears throat> So let's take a look at Mary Had a Little Lamb using this system of allegorical nonsense. If they were consistent, they would not be Gnostics, exactly. If they could think about money sensibly and work and logic, they wouldn't be socialists either. So the expression by means of, so what is, what is allegory? Well, allegory. It is poetry. It is myth. It is not literal. Right? They're not literal thinkers. They are poetic, mythical thinkers. So the expression by means of symbolic, fictional figures and actions of of truths or generalizations about or generalizations about human existence. Pardon me. So allegory is the expression by means of symbol, right, through fictional figures and fictional actions and of generalizations about human existence from Merriam Webster. It's a story, a play, a poem, a picture, or other work in which the characters and events represent particular qualities or ideas that relate to morals, religion, or politics, according to Cambridge. It's a story, a poem, or picture which can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political meaning. It doesn't mean it's a good <laughs> symbolism. It doesn't mean it's a good allegory or allegory. But, okay, allegory, right, plural, allegories, a story whose moral is represented symbolically. It's not literal. It's not factual. There's also platonic myth. Narrative stories and allegories used to convey philosophical ideas and concepts in a symbolic and metaphorical matter manner, sorry, in a metaphorical manner. A parable is what where we would, as Christians, this would be the closest that we have to this. It's a short, simple story that illustrates a moral or spiritual lesson. It typically features characters and events that represent abstract concepts or real-world situations, allowing for a deeper understanding or insight into a particular teaching or message. But this is not the same kind of symbolism as the allegory. Right? The allegory itself carries a particular symbolism, and that symbolism carries a particular meaning. It doesn't have to make sense. Exactly, Yako. It doesn't have to make sense. So, now, Mary Had a Little Lamb is allegory. So, Mary Had a Little Lamb is an English language nursery rhyme from the 19th century. Okay, First published by American writer Sarah Joseph Hale in 1830. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day. That was against the rule. It made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school. All right, let's see what the Gnostics will do with this. So the Gnostic success is derived from its method of interpretation. It's how it's interpreted. Okay. So, <clears throat> you may think this famous poem is about a little girl whose pet lamb followed her to school, but you would be wrong. Unfortunately, you are very, very wrong. If you were inducted... If you became inducted into the Gnostic mysteries, you would see that Mary is a teacher of Gnosis. The lamb is her student, and the fleece is the garment of bad thinking, of bad ideas, that was washed clean white because the student came to understand the deep Gnostic mysteries. The student then becomes so attracted to Gnostic teachings that he dares to enter the school, the temple of learning for the initiate to become one of the elite of the Gnosticism. Albert follows you to school, yes. And even though it was against the rules and cultural norms, those inducted into Gnonsense realize that the true Gnostic is above the rules and laws of the spiritual, of the material world. Let's just go back to, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day that was against the rule. It made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school. And suddenly we get this pile of nonsense. Do you understand? They took something simple and they interpret it. You see, what the Bible really said was, you understand where this goes? So nonsense fantasy becomes reality. 
contradictions are just reinterpreted. Uh, I'm going to skip this section. I'm going to skip this and we're going to go back to here. So the, it's how it's interpreted. The other Gnostics, the children who laugh and play, rejoice at the initiation of a new elite member. This presented Mary has a little lamb using Gnostic allegory as a method of interpretation. It explains how Gnosticism adapts so easily to any religious context. So did that make sense? Okay. So I did speak in the very first <clears throat> episode how I adapted the work. I saw a video of um, Professor Falk, um, who is a, a PhD Egyptologist, has his own YouTube channel. And um, we'll talk about that another time. So, <clears throat> so yeah, does that make sense? How they can take a basic story, completely reinterpret it, which means that they will exegete from the basic plain meaning and, and do something utterly disconnected, completely mythical based on, on something that's perfectly straightforward. It's just this Gnostic reinterpretation. It's the Gnostic way of thinking. It's denial of reality. It is, it is making magic. It is word magic. It is letter magic. The Muslims do it. And this idea has infiltrated the Western culture. So, yeah. So guys, does this make sense? I think <clears throat> I will wind down here. So, Vegetal says, I can't go anymore because I had the account on my other computer that broke. And, okay. Describe their tactics. Yeah, we've seen this all over the place. So, a challenge in Gnostic scholarship arises from the practice which involves interpreting written texts as figurative allegories. Thereby, you reverse the intended meaning. They derive the opposite. Right? They derive exactly, just like how the Bible is talking about Muhammad. Exactly. And, yeah, there's loads of other issues here. But you should see this, this mindset at play. So they reverse, they find the exact opposite. Everything is upside down, everything is twisted. That's the allegorical method. Everything literal becomes figurative and therefore it's reinterpreted to their personal desire, right? And unfortunately, the way that I hear it online is usually the Holy Spirit spoke to me and this is what it means, you see. <clears throat> so many leaps of logic or illogic, unlogic. So the Nag Hammadi Library, discovered in 1945, is the largest collection of Gnostic writings, <coughs> 52 texts. They date back as early as the 2nd century. They provide valuable insight into Gnostic literature. However, they offer limited information on how the Gnostics interpreted those words. Remember, they are never, as a Gnostic, you're never wrong. Right? The Gnostic can't be wrong. He has the secret knowledge. So if you challenge him, he will simply reinterpret it in a way that shows you to be wrong and him to be right. So when he says one plus one is two, and you say, hold on, but I've got this video of you saying X, he says, well, you took it out of context. What we really meant was, because you asked the question, and I was responding, blah, 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 blah. Do you understand? They can never be wrong. It's the art of never being wrong. So yes, and it's detached. It is anything you want it to be. So, so we can read their text, and you'll understand it in your mind, but... How they read it, how they mean it, or how they will make it up in that moment to refute you is just, who knows, right? So the Pauline epistles in the early church fathers tell us what early Christians believed, but also how Christians interpreted the sacred texts. The Nag Hammadi lacks the epistle genre. Gnostics did not write their beliefs in explicit doctrinal language. It, they made it up as they went, okay? Um, basically, you know, when I used to work at this company in the Middle East, when I was doing my work... I, there was a guy that used to be ex-special forces, but he was a chopper pilot. Interesting dude. And he used to say, you know, they would simply use what they called an MSU-13. Okay? They provide an MSU-13 as justification for their actions. An MSU-13 was a make shit up 13. Okay? They would just... And that's exactly what these guys are doing. Okay? <laughs> Arnold, that was very, very funny. So, yeah, Mary had a little lamb. Her father shot it dead. It followed her to school the next day between two slices of bread. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, Quran is an MSU 13. Exactly. All right. So understand this is what's going on. So now Nag Hammadi told us that the preferred method of information transmission was through oral allegory. The secret knowledge, though, was not written down to keep it secret. But the secret knowledge is also what you make up on the fly. It's the nonsense you make up on the fly. 
It's how you respond to polemics. That's why Islam adapts and changes in response to polemics. So as it faces a polemic, it then just makes up a story to refute that. Understand? That's how it stays alive. It's constantly juggling. It's, it's insanely good at this. But it's not logical. It's detached from reality. It, it will never be wrong. It never admits wrong. It is always right. And because you work within logic and you have a set framework, they will dance around that. Okay, so not all religious groups that use allegory are Gnostic. However, the abuse of this interpretive method allowed Gnosticism to usurp the symbols and writings of practically any faith by redefining them. So they become compatible with and subordinate to the Gnostics' own teachings. I'll repeat that last time and I'll finish here. Not all religious groups that use allegory are Gnostic. However, the abuse of this method allowed Gnostics to usurp the symbols and writings of practically any faith by redefining them. One group of people, of Gnostics, that constantly redefine everything besides Muslims are atheists. It is annoying, right? You ask them to define atheism. They freaking can't, right? So that they become compatible with and subordinate to the Gnostics' own teachings. And that is how the New Age religion is born. So, okay, guys, so I'll, I will call it a night here. I hope that's been in interesting and entertaining. Hope you've learned something about this. And um, if you do like it, please um, just give the channel a like. And um, yeah, if, if you liked it, subscribe. And I will call it a night. And uh, thank you very much for, for, for being here. And use this information and um, understand who you're dealing with, how they work. All right. So the science has evolved. Yes, exactly. The science has evolved. And John McDermott is very edifying, Lloyd. This is one of the best episodes ever. Thank you, 16-bit brawler. All right, so guys, that's it from me. Good night. And again, if you like what you hear, please share it. Tell your friends about it. Use it. Um, and yeah, if you want to support the channel, please do. It does take time to put all this together. But yeah, please use this. Pay it forward by actually using it on people. And Dobre Vecher, Sopanam Borgem. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Thank you very much, Lydia, for teaching us. May God richly bless you. Thank you, guys. So, till next time, guys. I should be on later this week.